The ground we stand on accounts for only 30% of the Earth's surface. So what about the rest? Well, that other 70% is our world ocean, which to many of us land dwellers may seem like a foreign concept, an intangible body of water largely separated from our day-to-day -day lives. But in reality, the ocean is the one common link that connects us all. The food we eat, the air we breathe, the storms we ride, and the economies we build are all dependent on our world ocean. On this podcast, we will dive into emerging markets, innovative technology, and conservation efforts to shed light on the ocean, the other 70%, that enables us to have a footprint, a home, and a life on Earth. The other 70% is brought to you by Nortec. As ocean enthusiasts, researchers, and technologists, we are on a mission to make an impact through innovation, exploration, and activism above and below the surface. Help keep us exploring by subscribing on your podcast platform of choice. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this week's episode of The Other 70%. I'm your host, Nevin DiParlo, and today we will be discussing one of the many threats facing underwater ecosystems, a phenomenon known as ghost fishing. When fishing gear gets lost or discarded in the ocean, it continues to trap and harm fish, marine mammals, and coral reefs. This problem is being tackled by an organization known as Ghost Diving, a team of highly skilled divers committed to removing fishing gear and other debris from the ocean. In this episode of The Other 70%, Ghost Diving founder Pascal Van Erp discusses the risks posed by ghost fishing the challenges associated with removing fishing gear, transforming harmful trash into a sustainable consumer product, and how he hopes to solve this problem with his committed team of skilled divers. Without further ado, let's dive into this broad sweeping conversation with Pascal. Pascal, welcome to the other 70%. Thanks for, for joining us today. Thank you. Cool. Um, yeah, so I have a lot of different questions for you, but you know, I think to start it off, your your company and your foundation is is called Ghost Diving, and um, you know, many people might not have a, a real understanding of what ghost fishing is and and what your organization is working towards. So, can you shed a little bit of light on that as to to what that means and what you your motivations are? Yeah, um, yeah, indeed. Um, our, our organization is called Ghost Diving, and we work on a topic called ghost fishing. Um, we recently uh, renamed our organization because we wanted to make a little bit more clear what the topic of ghost fishing is and what we are doing about it with divers, because that's how we work. Uh, ghost fishing is actually what um, uh, lost fishing gear does the moment it is um, lost or discarded underwater without human involvement. So it's still fishes. It's a very intelligent designed piece of equipment. Uh, fishing gear keeps on going. So when it's down there on the bottom, it keeps on fishing. The fish is still uh, untangled and it will die without a purpose. And that's uh, what we are doing. So uh, with, with scuba divers, we uh, work all over the world actually. And we um, clean up uh, lost fishing gear. Very cool. And so when you mean this fishing gear keeps fishing, you mean that, you know, when someone throws a fishing net overboard and it goes into a cycle and then other mammals or, or fish get caught in the, in that netting or whatever other equipment may be discarded. And so then you guys are going out to try and find that discarded gear and maybe release fish from it and then actually recover it from the ocean and, and recycle it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay, interesting. So how'd you get how'd you get into that? What was your motivation for it? Did did you always were you always attracted to the ocean, assuming you've been a diver for a long time? Yeah, well, um, it all started for me then in uh, the Netherlands. We uh, we live uh, next to the, the North Sea. Uh, the North Sea is a very interesting sea in terms of uh, um, yeah, na nature aspect natural aspects. Like we have uh, lots of currents, we have tides, uh, quite some big waves. The visibility is not always that good, but there are many, many, many wrecks, and that's very interesting for divers. And that's the reason we dive there because the rest of the North Sea, actually, the bottom is just one sandy bottom. There is nothing else. We do not have reefs, so uh, we call it objects where we dive on. It can be a shipwreck. It can be a bunch of stones lost by a cargo ship or whatever in the, in, in the past. 
Uh, there were quite some wars in uh, in the North Sea. That's the reason we have uh, very, very much uh, shipwrecks, uh, submarines, shipwrecks, planes, everything you can imagine is still in the North Sea. So we dive on those objects. And uh, with a group of divers, we started in 2007, just because, you know, we saw a lot of lost fishing gear down there. And to give a little bit information on that, um, for us, it's not complicated in the North Sea to find lost fishing gear. It's just everywhere. If you give me one object, we just put our boat there, we, we anchor, we, do, we go down, and I will give you a lost fishing gear because it's 100% hit everywhere. There was so much fisheries in the, North, in the North Sea for decades that it's literally everywhere. So th that on a side note. Um, so we, we, we see uh, lost fishing gear, and then we talk about commercial fishing gear and recreational angling fishing gear everywhere. And you can be bothered about that. Some people are not. They just come there for the wreck and they ignore it. But we didn't. We started to clean it up just sometimes in a dive, sometimes a little bit more. Sometimes we uh, we spend our whole dive on it. And, sometimes, and later on, we started to make it a sort of project. So we invited more people to, uh, to come over and to help us. And a lot of more people uh, started to get interested. Um, at that stage, I also got interested in the topic more and more. I did research all over the world. I tried to find out if there were more countries working on it. It was very minimal at those days. Uh, Noah was writing about it, uh, about the phenomenon, ghost fishing, but also very minimal. And um, yeah, that, that's, that's the moment we started the foundation on it. Uh, I think it was around 2012 we did that after several projects in the Dutch North Sea. And um, yeah, we, 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 we spent all our dives uh, on removal of lost fishing gear. And uh, that was picked up by the media, picked up by partners. We got very fast. We, uh, we managed to get some funders for our projects. So yeah, well, that's, that, that's where we are now. We are now uh, a very healthy organization. We work with uh, very, very nice partners who are funding our work. Uh, we are very uh, skilled and um, uh, advanced in the, in the topic of recycling and upcycling these days because that's also a very important topic for us. And yeah, we are happy. Yeah. <laughs> well, happy, happy, happy in a way that we can do what we love. It's still it's our passion. And I must confess that um, even when I'm doing recreational dives, uh, wherever in the world, I cannot let it loose. So for me, it's always I'm scanning for lost fishing gear. Yeah. And so this was in the Netherlands from pretty much early stages of your diving career. Okay. You started noticing that there was a lot of discarded fishing gear. Obviously, that kind of struck a nerve with you, bothered you. And then I, I guess, how long ago was it when you removed your first fishing nets on one of your dives? 2007. 2007. And then how long, how long ago did you actually start the foundation officially? Officially, foundation, uh, those days we were still called Ghost Fishing. We, we named our organization uh, to the phenomenon it was actually describing because the phenomenon was not so clear in the world. We did that all to make to generate more awareness in the world. Uh, we started that in 2012. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. And it, how many, you know, just out of curiosity to put a, a, a scale to things, how many fishing nets or how do you think are lost at, at sea annually or, or right now? I don't know if there's even a way to really quantify it. Well, there is one standard figure. Uh, I think it was brought up by the FAO once. And they are talking about 640,000 tons each year. Wow. And, you know, we do, we do not think that with our organization, we will solve this problem, but that's also not, the, that's not our purpose. Our purpose is to let the world know what is going on down there. And maybe this way we can change it. Right. Well, in my case, I mean, I'm someone who's, who's like very passionate about the ocean. I mean, my work involves the ocean. I personally love many activities around the ocean, like kiting and surfing. And I actually just went diving for the first time like a week ago, which was pretty cool. cool. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I don't, I, I, I was not familiar with the phenomenon of ghost fishing until probably a week or two ago when I first stumbled upon what you guys were, were working on. And so I think it, it's great because it is certainly bringing, um, bringing some attention to the issue. And, yeah. you know, in terms of, 
the what the future holds and i know you said that it's not going to be possible for you guys to solve this on your own because there are 640,000 tons of you know just fishing that's estimated to be discarded in the ocean each year you know how do you how do you envision scaling the operation or empowering other groups to maybe a- approach the problem with you um yeah that's 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 quite complicated because um yeah okay we are we are underwater and it's a very uh, hazardous uh, environment so uh people should not be on the water we cannot breathe there it's a very it's, it's dangerous for us okay so what we yeah. are doing with diving is uh minimizing uh, um, the hazardous environment by uh by by safe safety actually so diving is actually making sure that you are not dying on the water and you can just enjoy the underwater environment so if you add there a little aspect and it's called work then it's a whole different ball game so uh, what we are doing is yeah okay we, we can we can discuss it for for a very long time but it is work we are clearing up fishing nets and we go to depths of well, more maximum 60 meters with, with what we are doing. So it, it can be really dangerous and it's all depending on strict safety. This is the reason that we cannot scream into the world, listen guys, um, whoever wants to join us, this is amazing. You will, you will love it. Uh, join us, uh, jump in the water, remove fishing. It's, no, absolutely not. We are trying to educate people and tell them, uh, mainly in the beginning of the conversation, that what we are doing is looks very cool, but it's very dangerous. And please be aware, know what you are doing. And this is, if we are uh, embracing new groups in the world, uh, sometimes they approach us and they want to do stuff like we do. We go in a conversation with each other and we try to figure out who, who they are, how they dive and how they think about safety aspects. It's not cool. We, we try to make it, it looks cool when we when we have nice videos and nice photos. I, we, the, the first thing people are yelling at us, oh, this is so crazy and cool what you guys are doing. Yeah. Yeah, but be aware, removing a lost fishing net from a depth of 50 meters on a World War II submarine is dangerous. It's really dangerous. So this is, yeah. this is actually always the balance I try to find in... Uh, encouraging people to do this is safety safety it must be that's the most important thing we have right absolutely and you know how long i'm sure it varies depending on the site that you're cleaning up but you know how long is a typical dive just to put that in perspective in terms of how difficult it is to actually remove nets it's very depending on our target sometimes it's a very small net sometimes it's a few lines uh it's very depending on where we dive, how deep it is. Um, well, just for comparison, an average North Sea dive will take between 45 minutes and one hour. And it's not because we are done there, down there. It's also not because we are in decompression, if you know that term for scuba diving. Uh, but uh, that's because of the tides. The tides are turning. We only dive on slack water. So it's going from high or low tide to the opposite. And right. then we have, to, we have to get rid of there. So otherwise we will be washed to uh, either the UK or Norway. So this, right. is, this, this, is, this is for your idea that it, it, everything is, and, and that's the other aspect. It's not only safety. You do not take care of yourself. We also have to be aware that there is a time window. You right. have to get rid of it because, yeah, you know. And the, the depth, and that's the other aspect when we are going, for example, to the Mediterranean Sea where we are operation, where we quite some operations. Uh, that's mostly a little bit more deep. The North Sea is going maximum 30 meters. That's all within, we, so we, how we call it, recreational limits. Uh, but when we go further than thir- deeper than uh, 30 meters, then it's for us a technical deep dive. And yeah, okay, then decompression is the biggest factor there. And then the dive will last for a maximum of 75 mit- minutes which is more than half, half of that time is uh, decompression stops. Can you explain to people who may, may not be familiar with diving um, that what decompression is and why that's, you know, really important for diver safety? Um, yeah, but let's, let's explain this in a very, very simple way. If you have, yeah. um, if you have a bottle of soda, okay, and you shake it, you know, and you open it, then you will see that the bubbles will come up very fast. 
Okay. And this is exactly what happens to the human body when you are down on the bottom, a certain depth, and there's a lot of pressure because that's, that's, that's how it works. Of course, you have a lot of bars on your, uh, on, your, on your body. Then there are little bubbles coming in your bloodstream. So if you are going fast up to the surface, those bubbles will uh, uh, multiply and, and uh, the populate your blood, bloodstream and cause very dangerous side effects on your body. And that's exactly what we are trying to do, avoid. So if you go, um, uh, if, you, if you surface very slowly, then the bubbles will not go, uh, will not multiply that heavily and will not cause an accident. This is right. the most simple way I can explain it. Yeah, no, that's perfect. It's perfect. And how did you, and I guess all of the divers involved in your organization are, you know, get into technical diving? Are there are a lot of people with more of a military background with diving experience or, or technical diving as a career. How, how does that, uh, how does that look? Well, we, we, we do have quite some uh, uh, people around us with, uh, indeed, military uh, background, of course, because for some reason, those people feel really attracted to what we are doing. But that's not the not majority. Um, technical diving is actually... Um, people step into technical diving because they want to um, go to certain places which are not reachable for recreational divers, such as... Uh, caves. I'm not a cave diver myself, but there are people who love caves. And then you go uh, un, uh, in a cave full of water with an overhead environment. You cannot get out to the surface immediately. You have to go backwards. So then we are talking about technical dive. And um, that's actually the same. In the same way, you talk about wreck diving, deep wreck diving, because uh, we just discussed the topic of decompression. So you understand when you are on a deep wreck, you cannot go to the surface immediately either because you have your decompression stops to go. So if, if it's going in that direction of dives, you want to go deeper, further, whatever, then we are, then you have to go step into the area of technical diving. Right. Yeah. Very interesting. I just, you know, I, I was very curious how people kind of became attracted to it. And, and I would assume, you know, if you're into diving, you obviously care about preserving the ecosystems that you're diving in. You know, everyone wants to go and see colorful reefs and, and shipwrecks that are alive with, with fish life and not fish that are trapped in nets. So if you have that experience and background, I'm sure that you're, you're motivated or pushed towards um, helping preserve it in, in any way you can. Most of the divers do, and that's that's very nice to see. That, uh, that that that's quite funny because I go to Egypt myself quite often, and then um, then I then we dive there just mostly recreational dives, and you know because I cannot let it go, I'm always scanning for unnatural structures on the water like uh, bags, uh, we plastic waste, fishing lines, everything. and I collect everything during my dives, and people see that. They ask yeah. questions and they start doing it themselves. Actually, you are just sort of infecting them. I discussed this topic several times with people around me. And uh, the, the, the most common thing that people say, there should be more trash cans on beaches. If you ask me, I don't want to see any crash, trash can on beaches. Because I think at the moment we put a solution for people, they don't feel responsible themselves anymore. So... If you ask me, we should remove all the trash cans from beaches so people are motivated to take their trash home because there is no solution. If you yeah. provide solutions, then people are building on that. And uh, when the solution is full, the trash can is full, they throw it next to it because what else? You know, right. It's time to be responsible yourself. This is how I see this. Yeah, and it's it's so in such an interesting issue because you, know, you, you would – think that more people would understand and recognize the impact that plastic pollution and just pollution in general on land has on their, their local ecosystems and, you know, just harming the natural en environment. But for some reason, it seems like they're really need some way, I don't know how, but someone needs to incentivize people more on land even to help pick up after themselves. Kind of like you said, I mean, there's no solution, there's no silver bullet, but um, I'm not sure what can be done to, to make people uh, recognize the importance more and, and incentivize them to actually take action. 
Awareness. Um, what we do is uh, we work from the beginning with uh, professional photographers and uh, videographers. We take them down there and everything we see, we, we, well, we make visual, visual of it and we bring it to the surface and show it to people. And everybody is amazed and love what we are doing. And they're amazed by how dirty the underwater environment is. But you have to understand that the, the lost fishing gear we find is mostly lost at sea. Yeah. But the plastic we find is not lost at sea. It's coming from land. Yeah, right. Because, you know, if you walk, and there's a very uh, recent example, if I walk in the hub in the Egypt, where I was a few uh, last month, actually, um, then you see exactly what I just described. Along the coastline, there are many trash cans. They really make an effort to put, uh, put trash into a tra trash can there. But they are not so busy with cleaning them, with emptying them. Yeah. So everything is falling out or throw it next to it. Well, and then there is a very big wind and everything comes into sea. So what we are seeing there on the, on the local reefs, and that's the only thing, that's only the spots we are diving. We don't see the rest of the ocean. It's a lot of bags, bags everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And, it, you know, more specifically to, to talk about a little bit the impact of, you know, this pollution and, and fishing gear in particular on the subsea ecosystems, right? So that people understand that trash on land obviously has an impact on, you know, their land-based ecosystems and, and with plastic pollution or any type of pollution. I've seen the videos of, you know, fish and, and marine mammals getting entangled in nets. Obviously that impacts, you know, their lives at sea and, and also the lives of maybe their, their prey, their predators. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on how ghost fishing in particular impacts the subsea ecosystems and maybe the communities even on land in some ways? Well, the phenomenon of ghost fishing is impacting, um, uh, yeah, of course, the sea life and the, and the ecosystem because uh, besides the fisheries, there is another danger which is continuously catching fish right. and sea mammals. Uh, you have to understand, sometimes we, we see underwater, we see, um, we call that the, the circle of death, I will explain. The moment, the moment there is a, a net lost at sea, it's catching, it's, it's stuck at the reef or stuck at the shipwreck or an object. And uh, it's still catching fish because they, they swim into it, they got caught, um, whatever possibility there is to get caught in a net. And that is attract scavengers. There are um, uh, lobsters coming, crabs coming, and they are eating the fish, gut entangled themselves. That is attracting more underwater life because bigger animals are eating them. So they come also. Sometimes you see a seal dead in a net. Sometimes you see a shark. Uh, in some cases, there are even whales found or dolphins. You know, It's continuously going on. No human involvement. And we cannot monitor it. We cannot help it because in most of the areas in the ocean and the seas in the world, majority actually, there are no people, there are no divers. So we don't know what's going on down there. So this is affecting the ecosystem and affecting also the fish resources. Right. So nets get lost at sea. Mammals that are dead or maybe not dead get caught in the nets. More prey comes to maybe eat those dead animals. Then they get caught in the nets. And then it's just kind of a, a circle of death. And the net might float back up, catch more fish, and then keep going forever. Because I would assume that the, the fishing gear, I think it's nylon, right, that most of the nets are made out of? It's very depending on, uh, on which country you are talking about. Uh, nylon was used in the past. Most of the countries, because they want to reduce costs, they step over to polymers. So it's a very, right. it's, it's more, uh, it's more cheap. Yeah. And that's the reason they step uh, over to it. So actually it's a wide variation of, uh, of uh, materials. Uh, Mediterranean, you also, you see actually a lot of uh, nylon, but also a lot of hemp sometimes. Regardless of the material, is it, I mean, I would guess that the lifespan of the nets is pretty long, right? It's not indefinite. I mean, they're, they're not degrading in the, in the water over time, right? The plastics are degrading, but it takes a very, very long time. Right. Yes. And the nylon will just keep, will keep going forever. Same nylon is also, it, it, at one point it will start degrading, but then it's ending up in microplastic. It will float around. It will end up in the, in the ecosystem. So that, that's it. ending up on our plate. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so for people to really understand the how even the subsea environment is impacting them from a, a pollution standpoint, you know, 
even if these nets are floating, they're constantly shedding, you know, microplastics or, or pollutants off of those nets over time. And then if fish are eating those, those microplastics, then we end up eating those microplastics when we eat the fish. So it's not, not healthy for the fish. It's not healthy for us. And it, it doesn't benefit anyone. Yeah, well, you know, we live in the Netherlands. We have a very uh, nice and big uh, fishing community and they're always promoting eat fresh fish because it's very good and very healthy for you. Are you sure? <laughs> you know, this is, this is the, the question I always bounce back. Are you really sure about this? Because the fish is eating the pollution we cause as yeah. humanity. So I like to see that. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's a, it's important for people to really understand that. And I think that's one of the things that very few people, you know, in the, in the real global grasp of the world fully understand. Um, I don't think that many people make those connections to what, what the impacts are on subsea life and then what we end up eating. So it's definitely important to bring some light to that. Um, one of the other things that I was really curious about is you guys dive all over the world, right? There, there's nowhere in the world where people don't fish in coastal communities, right? So there are, there, there's, this issue is everywhere, right? How do you determine where your dives are? Like, how do you target the areas? I assume you go after reefs and wrecks where things are easily caught, but it, you know, I would assume you're targeting your dives very specifically. Yeah, well, um, it is a combination of, uh, of sources. Uh, the main, main, the main source of our diving targets is connected to the diving industry. So uh, popular reefs, diving sites, shipwrecks, uh, these kind of things. We go, we go there, our other divers will inform us about a, a situation going on down there, and then we go there. Uh, but the other source is the fisheries. We, we worked from our start very carefully together with the fisheries. Uh, they, we really targeted on the fact that they should be our friends. We are not against them. We are uh, willing to collaborate with them because I think that together we can solve this problem. They are not our enemy. So what they do is they inform us about locations uh, and that's all over Europe actually, where they lost net, uh, their nets or when their net is getting stuck in another net or object or they warn us for whatever they find because they are more at sea than we are. So. These are our eyes and ears. And this is actually, uh, to be honest, um, after we started, it was actually mainly because of the diving sites. But now it's turning. We get more locations from the fishing industry or from environmentalists who are doing research on uh, marine protected areas, coral reefs, and they find that there is a lot of fishing that's down there. It's happening, for example, in Italy uh, a lot. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, we have several sources. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess as you guys have grown, that connection has probably, you know, the, the, the network, I guess, has really expanded. So, you know, kind of playing the telephone game, more eyes, more ears out there to tell you where to go. And then you can mobilize divers more easily. Exactly. Yeah. We, we, we also set up a few uh, report fishing gear uh, campaigns recently in Greece, uh, because Greece has a very, very huge uh, fishing industry, but very small and local. So every village has his own but we, we, we brought uh, even on a tv commercial that they can report their fishing nets anonymously and just let us know where they found it or where they lost it and we go there to remove it that's working yeah. very, very well i must say yeah no that's great i mean it's good that people are again like we talked about earlier you know making a connection to it and actually taking some action even if it's just sharing you know locations so that, that's good and how many I guess I would assume you guys keep track. How, how much or how many, I guess, fishing nets do you remove every year by pounds or length? Oh, this is, this is a very challenging question because by hand, you have to understand when we are just working on the North Sea, then by hand, we every dive with a team of 10, we can remove around approximately 300, 350 kilograms of nets because it's all handwork and we have the time window we have to be ready in uh, but when we do bigger projects the biggest biggest net ever we uh, we recovered in three days with a team of six was three tons three thousand kilos so wow. 
it's very depending on the net. It's very depending on the situation. But I, I really cannot come up with a figure we did by hand with all our teams till now. What we do have is uh, we have a figure available about uh, what we collected together with fishermen because uh, we also work with an organization called Healthy Seas. And Healthy Seas is uh, uh, actually focusing on the upcycling and recycling aspect of getting the nets out of the water and end-of-life nets from fisheries. Uh, even fish farming. So we we collect from several sources, from the divers, which is actually a very small part, uh, the fish farming industry and the fishing industry with end of life nets, and all those nets together are ending up through healthy seas. I, I just I have to figure out how much it was last time, but I think we were now in all the years we work since 2013. The healthy seas initiative is is operating. I think it was 550 tons we collected in total. Wow. Yeah. And uh, so that's, that was a good segue because I want to talk a little bit about upcycling and recycling. I know that uh, Healthy Seas, which you're, you're also involved with, right? You, you work yep. directly with Healthy Seas, um, is more or less your upcycling partner, right? So as you, the way that I understand it is that, you know, you at Ghost Diving or any other diving organizations and, and fishing organizations, aquaculture, uh, actually will recycle their their gear that they collect and and donate that to healthy seas who then upcycles it and turns it into products that can be used globally is that correct that's correct and this is this is a very complicated task yeah so can you can you just dive into that explain a little bit what that process looks like and why it's so important it's it's very you know for us it, it all started and let's let's go to the beginning when we started to remove fishing gear from the from the North Sea uh, till we met healthy seas so actually from 2007 till 2013 we didn't have a location to put our nets in so it all ended up basically in landfill um, there is a positive side on that and there is a negative side on that negative side is actually that um, okay. There is no purpose. It's just ending up on that landfill. That's also bad. Okay. The positive side is it's not in a marine environment anymore. So we always try to focus on, okay, we, we try to recycle, upcycle, regenerate our materials. We, we, uh, we recover as much as possible. And that's very complicated because of the different type of materials used. But the most important part is that it's out of the environment. So, um, uh, for, for example, the nylon six part, that is the part where it all started with us. So the Health Sea started with uh, focusing on the nylon six part. Uh, a company called Aquafil is one of the main founders of Health Seas. And uh, they are really interested in the nylon six because with that, they make new nylon and that will be used for new products. So they were started to fund our projects. And yes, indeed, the, the nylon six part, which is a very small part of, our, of the nets we recovered, ended up at the recycling plants, but the rest, yeah, that was still a problem. So during all the years, we uh, we were approached by several partners, and it, sometimes it's a, it's an artist who wants to make something to create awareness uh, about the topic. So they put uh, lost fishing gear together to make a uh, the art of it and just show it to the public. But it can also be, um, and that's very popular these days, uh, jewelry. So uh, little items you can put on your on your wrist or on your. Sometimes you see it in rings or dog leashes. Uh, there is a, there's one of our partners is called Bracenet, and they're based in Germany. Um, they get our nets. So um, if we find nets which are re respectively clean and they are not made of nylon six, they collect them, they take them from us, and they make bracelets out of it. And that's and that's so that's so amazing because. With this, you do not only wear a bracelet, but when you are sitting, for example, on a, on, a, on a birthday party, people look at your wrist and they think, is that a piece of fishing net? And then the conversation starts. And that's yeah, exactly right. what we want. Because, you know, I can show a lot by showing videos and photo, photos to the public. But if these kind of topics are ending up on a birthday party in a conversation between people who are not into what we are doing, brilliant. Right. Exactly. And it all comes back into the, the, the cycle of education, right? Because that's how you, you stop it from the source in the first place, right? Exactly. Yeah. No, I think that's really cool. And, and I, it's something that, 
we've seen some more of, right? I mentioned earlier, like this upcycling concept. We've seen, um, you know, companies like the Ocean Cleanup and Four Ocean, for instance, who might be more, you know, mainstream have come out with products that they they create out of the recycled plastics and they sell those to fund, you know, their their ongoing cleanup initiatives. Are you guys doing something similar to where, where obviously you're a nonprofit, so you're you're selling products or I guess your partners are selling products that then go back to help fund your cleanup and diving efforts more? Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Because all the, uh, for example, Bracenet, they're donating 10% of their uh, profit to uh, back into our work. Yeah. Uh, sometimes they do extra donations. So uh, that's, that's really cool. And um, a Health to Seas Foundation is actually mainly funding all our projects. And uh, yeah, we, we deliver our footage back to them so that they can promote their, uh, their product based yeah. on our images. And together with the, the, the fishing industry, they have a story to tell. Yeah. Uh, and I think this is really important for us. For us, it's like, okay, first of all, we got rid of our uh, collected nets. So we didn't have to dump it on the, uh, on the, on the landfill. And in the second stage, they started to donate our to our to our work, so we could do our projects. And the projects are, yeah, well, they can be really expensive because when the project is going technical, yeah, then you have to uh, then the gas gas prices are going uh, six seven hundred percent. So then we are talking about quite some expenses. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's. Uh, I mean. Uh, and I guess you guys also have some donations maybe from individuals. I'm sure that, you know, anyone yeah. listening could go on and, and make donations to you guys as well. Absolutely. If you, if you go to our website, ghostdiving.org, then you, then you'll find the button donate. And if you, if you click on that, we, uh, we have uh, PayPal options, bank transfer options, uh, multiple options just to support us. And that's running quite well because people, the more people who are seeing what we are doing, uh, more people got it hooked into it and just out of nothing sometimes we received uh, quite some donations and that's really cool right yeah no it's amazing i think just like you said it's a conversation starter that's so important um a quick backtrack to you know uh, some diving experiences that you've had removing nets and you mentioned that the the biggest net you removed was three tons i think was what you said and it was off of one was it off of a reef or off of a wreck it was on the reef. That was uh, so far the most crazy we have ever experienced. Um, we were with a relatively small team with six divers. And uh, we went to uh, Sicily. More specifically, the, uh, it's a harbor place called Lippery. It is a small uh, fishing community. It's in Italy. Uh, I don't know if, if some people don't know where it is, but it's in Italy. And um, we were, we were there for an environmental project because there were some net, nets and long lines because the long line fisheries is very big there uh, around in all the reefs there. And uh, we, we started to do some projects there. Uh, the locations were given by fishermen and by local diving centers. So we, we were there to do that project. And at one point, uh, one of the fishermen told us, listen, there's still a net on the specific reef very close near, close by. And um, it's probably from a fish farm. Uh, 10 years ago, it uh, went, uh, it got loose in the, it got lost in the storm and it came on our reef. It's still there. The, the mate already in the past a few attempts to remove it, but nobody managed. So maybe you can have a look at that. Yeah, I don't think it will, it will work out, but you know, at least take a look. It's okay, we, we went there. And um, we found immediately the, the net actually, but it was already covered by a lot of sand and uh, and uh, marine life. Well, not so many much marine life actually. It was more sand. So actually, we saw a few meters of the net. We saw coming out of the net, but it was covering the whole reef. It was hard to see because already ten years it was down there. And uh, we started to lift it a bit. And at one point, we found out there was a lot of stones and sand into the net. We cut that out. And the further we got, the further we got, the, you, have to, you have to imagine that we put uh, bags on top of those nets filled with air and air is going up on the water. So that's the way we are lifting the bags of uh, lifting the nets. Um, uh, we were cutting and cutting and within one dive, we looked up and the net reached the surface and it was 35 meters deep there and it was still connected to the bottom. And that's the moment we realized that we thought, okay, this is... This is a real badass net. 
So we uh, went out. We for the second day we came back with more lift bags. We did, we had a lot of tricks to put uh, lift bags we used on the top back down there. We used a very big one on the top eventually, and we managed to get out that net within two days. Uh, well, exactly, we put it to the surface, and then we saw that huge monster net, how we called it at that moment, of three tons. And uh, we we had. It took us another day to get it out because first it was on the top of the sur- on the surface, but we first had to go to a shallow place, a shallower place to release it on the ground, and to um, um, to make it actually handle to handle it on board of the boat. So uh, we didn't have a crane; we had to pull it out with the fishermen together with our hands. But a big net of three tons, it's impossible to get in. So we made a sort of sausage out of it. To, uh, we, we used a lot of ropes to bundle the net on 10 meters of depth, and then we lifted it up again, and this way we put it into the boat. It was a massive operation. It took a lot of media attention. Uh, it brought us very close to the Coast Guard of Italy. Uh, these are our friends now. Later on, they did a, we did a project together a year later. They were very anxious about us because they came to us and they thought, okay, this is our bunch of recreational divers. They are not commercial. They are lifting a huge net. We have to keep an eye on them. So they were continuously around us. Yep. But after they saw what we were doing, okay, the deal was set. So they were our friends and we did we did some projects later on together. And we are still in contact with them. So it, it really had an effect on the local community. Yeah. I would assume, I mean, a net that size probably for that long too, sitting on that reef really had a, a negative impact on much of the life that was there maybe when the net first first actually entangled the on the reef exactly and and the best part of this all was that most of the nets we are recovering mainly in the, for example the north sea that's such a bunch of different materials that it's very hard to recycle but this net of three tons was already for so long under the sand and it was relatively clean and it was pure nylon so we managed to uh, cut this net in pieces and transport it to the recycling factory and it's completely recycled. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. I mean, that's a, that's, it's so cool to see the full cycle, right. Of actually physically removing the nets, you know, documenting that removing process, recycling it, upcycling it, selling the products, and then, you know, educating people on why this is so, so critical. So uh, well done. It's, it's, it's very motivating. It's cool. Thank you. We still love yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess, I mean, you, you get to dive for a living, so that's not, uh, that's not terrible either. Yeah. Well, actually th- th- this is also, a, I have to correct it a little bit because I'm not diving for a living. Um, I'm, for a living, I work for Health Seas and I coordinate and uh, organize the diving trips for volunteer divers. And all the diving right. I do myself is still voluntary. Still voluntary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I guess, yeah, that's the, uh, you know, diving for you is is really working probably at, every time you go down because you're trying to clean, you know, even if you're going on a recreational fun dive, I'm, I'm sure you're still focused on on removing plastic and trash that you see. Our job never ends. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, well, Pascal, I really have uh, have enjoyed learning about ghost fishing and, and your initiatives at Ghost Diving. Can we tell people where they can donate, follow your operations, buy the products from Healthy Seas. We can link all of it into the the show notes, but anything you want to share with the audience about how they can follow along? Well, actually, everything you need to know and all links to all organizations, partners, donate page, whatever you want to find, you can find on our website, uh, ghostdiving.org. And uh, from there, you will find everything. Great. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll definitely include all of that in the in the description and show notes for the episode. And um, we de- we encourage anyone to to donate and purchase products and follow along and, and understand the importance of of what you and your team are doing at at Ghost Diving. So thanks again for for coming on to the show. We we really enjoyed it. And uh, good luck with with the rest of your your trash removal and, and fishnet removal dives. Well, uh, thank you very much for having me. If you're interested in learning more about or supporting Ghost Diving, we suggest you check out their website at ghostdiving.org, linked in the description for this podcast. 
If you want to buy a bracelet made of upcycled fishing gear to support the cause, head to bracenet.net, also linked below. We hope you enjoyed this episode of The Other 70% with Nortech. As always, we are looking for new ways to bring together those with an interest in our blue planet. Tune in again later this month to hear from more inspiring entrepreneurs, technologists, and activists who are building the blue vision for the future.